morning, everybody. I'm glad to say I slept well last night and I think I might be over my jet lag, so I feel more alive. Um, looks like our PowerPoint's not quite ready. Uh, what's going on here? You've got, oh, you've got it there. You're under control. Right, here we go. I'm going to tell you the story of, um, of adoption in Western Australian agriculture. Hopefully, you'll find something interesting, interesting in it for you. I'm also on Twitter, and, um, and uh, that I find that a very useful uh, way of communicating with the world. And the world's become a much smaller place, I think, through Twitter. Um, that's my site, and um, that's my combine and my equipment. And um, this is one agricultural spokesperson. His name's Geoffrey Smith. Uh, his science is not very strong, I might add. And he's one of the contributors to demonising genetically modified crops through his very special techniques. And I kid you not, he's written a movie called Genetic Roulette. Um, crazy, really. But this sort of uh, view of the world is gaining a lot of traction. Uh, it's gaining a lot of traction against glyphosate. And I fear that there's a great risk that we're heading into the dark ages for agriculture. And this is certain to cause mass human worldwide starvation of the planet. And um, a lot of people maybe watching this video can congratulate yourself on the great role that you're having in doing this. Right, so I'm doing a PhD at the moment and this is the summary of my PhD of where I'm at so far. I've, there's four main topics I'm covering. The first is the first 30 years of adoption of direct drilling or reduced tillage, which is not no tillage. Uh, and then, and I've written a paper on this, it's hopefully be published soon. The second one is uh, the no-till story from 1990 in Western Australia to 2010. And then the third one is the economic impact of no tillage adoption through using computer models, which we know, a friend of mine said, all models are wrong, some models are useful. And I think they're right. And then the fourth one, which comes to the comment that I just made addressing to the camera, is to look at the risk of no tillage of potentially losing glyphosate basically through activism, not through truth or reality, but through the organic industry basically trying to scare people to make more money selling their produce with an unsustainable technology called ploughing. And the best no-till um, work that's been done with organics is by Professor Martin Entz, a friend of mine at University of Winnipeg in Canada, and it basically showed he lost 70% of the yield by doing no-till with organics. But he got very good diversity of plant species in the crop, which he was very positive about talking about in his paper. But if you think about sustainability, why give two-thirds of the yield to the weeds? and nature. I don't understand it. It's a different mindset. It's another religion, in my view. Right, so here's um, why did we get into no-till? Well, wind erosion and water erosion was a big catalyst, and that soil on the, on the right-hand side there was actually from a farm next door to me, where I farm. This was two years ago. I had no runoff whatsoever, but we had 60 millimetres of rain in about two hours, and he had no cover on his soil, and all the water just ran off. And he said it was a drought year. Well, it wasn't. I yielded 1.7 tonne in a very dry environment of wheat, but he, or he lost his water. And this is when I was tw uh, 22 years of age. I was doing my honours project at the University of Western Australia. This is the farm that I grew up on, the family farm, which one brother managed to grab and the rest of us were moved aside. That's another story for another day. However, Bob Twigg, um, a land care conservation expert, um, on the, sorry, a, a farmer on the land care group, m did a project and in the project he said, our soils are becoming useless and we need to make a sustainable system. He was even so radical as to suggest, Richard Bell, that we probably should go to kangaroos. The sheep are destroying the, 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 the organic matter over summer and, um, and we, we need to do something different. And this was the beginning of no-till. Now this is my crop last year. And I'm very pleased to say, on my farm, I have continuous no-tilled. This is canola stubble. I don't have much canola in my rotation, but where I have a problem, Roundup Ready canola is very powerful. It means I do not have to burn my stubble. 
A lot of people that have not adopted Roundup Ready technology have had to burn their stubble. So GM technology allows us to keep our stubble. Now stubble is food for the soil, as grain is for man. So said Carlos Crevetto from Chile, one of our no-till champions. This is where I farm on the edge of the desert. And it's a fascinating experience. It's an incredible ride. Um, I've been doing it for 10 years now, right next to the town of Morrowa. So you can Google Earth, and if you really hate me, you know where to send the bomb. This is my crop two years ago, 12-inch row spacings wheat, very sustainable. South Australian no-till farmers came over and visited me. They're friends of mine. I helped to create the West Australian no-till farmers, the South Australian no-till farmers, and I had input into the Victorian no-till farmers. So I'm, I'm, I'm part of the brotherhood of friends there, and I'm pleased to say here amongst this audience, I'm one of your friends. And we've just had a tremendous three days together of fellowship, friendship, arguing with each other, sharpening each other. The Bible says, man sharpens man like iron sharpens iron. I believe it to be true. And we've seen that this, this week. Right, tillage definitions, multiple tillage. Forget traditional tillage or conventional tillage. What does traditional mean? What does, what does convention mean? Forget it. It's a useless term. Throw it away. Multiple tillage. If you've got more than one tillage before seeding, it's, well, two tillages before seeding, it's multiple tillage, and it could be five of them. If you reduce tillage, in our definitions, we started these in 1993 through the Want for Group, and all Australian no-till groups adopted them, and I think they're useful. And I'd implore the Global Conservation Group to consider this seriously. Reduce tillage, one pass, full cut, one pass of full cut soil disturbance before seeding, and then seeding uh, direct drilling is seeding once with a full cut. No-till is seeding with 5 to 20% topsoil disturbance, topsoil being the top 10 centimetres. And then zero-till is seeding with less than 5% topsoil disturbance. This man here is the first man in Australia to do zero-till. And he came on my trip to, that's in Rondonopolis last year, that's from my website, a Gary Hine. Gary's a great guy. And um, he, 1963, he... Um, uh, actually, I'll, I'll sh I've got more slides on this. I'll... Here he is. This is his farm. He, um, the, the, you can see behind that vehicle, he's in the front seat, not driving. That's his dad. His dad's name was actually William, which is a good name, by the way. <laughs> um, but Gary, um, there he is, smiling in the front seat. And he had just driven the cedar. And the cedar was a culty trash with no soil disturbance. And he was seeding. His, his dad read Plowman's Folly by Edward Faulkner, and that was in 1962. He read the 1944, I think, edition of Faulkner, something like that. And when he read that, he got inspired, and he'd heard about this product called spray seed, or gramoxone, actually, gramoxone the paraquat diquat, which was invented in the UK in the late 50s. And, and so he then, um, the dad imported it into Australia. First person to ever use um, a bipyridal in Australia in 1963. And they did eight hectares with paraquat spraying out lollium rigidum, annual ryegrass, to seed a perennial ryegrass. And that's what you see in the background there. There's three little areas. They add up to eight hectares. So that's the first zero till that I've found in Australia. And very close to the world. It was only a year or two before that that others did some. Here's me as a young boy. I spent many hours on the tractor without a cab, without gloves, in cold temperature, in the rain. And I used to love going into the wind because the exhaust pipe off the old Chamberlain tractor would blow into your face and warm you up. And I soaked up all that carbon dioxide and I tell you, it didn't do me any damage, I don't think. I don't think, I don't think, I don't think. Maybe it did. <laughs> now, history of reduced tillage in West Australia, part one, direct drilling. E.W. Russell did a lot of work in the UK on no tillage. And Professor Anne Hamlin told me the story because he was her lecturer at, at university. You'd be interested in that, Richard. Um, and um, he, where there were no weeds and he went straight in, no yield penalty. And then Faulkner in 43, Plowman's Folly. Then the Bipyridals, 55 onwards. It, it's not real clear the history exactly how they did it in the lab, but by the end of 1960, they had had it. They'd got par paraquat and diquat. Um, and then, amazingly to me, I've been searching on the internet for papers, the beginning of no-till in the world, and I would ask anybody to correct me if I'm wrong, but the first 
knockdown herbicide, excluding atrazine as a knockdown, because that was done in 58, I think, was this product from a New Zealand researcher before Diquat got into the market. And he, he applied it and planted brassicas and got seven tonne per hectare of dry matter. And, um, and he sprayed the herbicide on the day that I was born. And I'm no-till Bill. Now, if someone can prove me wrong, I'll be happy to have it because truth is the most important thing in this game that we're in, in agriculture. Um, so anyway, I digress a little bit there. Then I talk about Gary. Then Professor Tim Reeves did some magnificent work in Victoria. He worked with ICI and they then imported spray seed or gramoxone um, paracot diquat into Australia for that research effort. And then in 68, it started to really happen in Western Australia. Uh, a wonderful man called Jeff Pierce wrote an article called Chemical Ploughing. And he touted the early, resist, early time of sowing opportunities that the Department of Agriculture's research had shown in the 1930s, that when they plant on the 5th of April, their yields are high. But now we were planting on the 5th of July because we had to control weeds. We ploughed once, ploughed twice, ploughed three times, and then we seeded. And then we still had ryegrass, which is our main weed. So this was the old system. I'm going to run out of time, I think, so I'll... Let me know when I've got five minutes. Can someone, please? <laughs> um, here we've got uh, the technique that was promoted in the early 70s by ICI, Empirical Chemical Industries, from the UK. And it was to spray and then seed. And they called it spray seed. Um, and you could plough, you, you get the rain, you plough, and then you scarify, and then you spray, and then you seed. And that's sort of what we did, but we didn't have the spray. We had a second plough in there and uh, on the, my farm. And then below was a, a more advanced technique, which was direct drill. So reduced till is the top one, if you like. You're reducing the number of tillages. The lower one is um, direct drill. So you, you rain, and then you wait for the weeds to germinate. Then you graze with your sheep, which was very important when sheep were worth a lot of money, because Australia rode on the sheep's back in the 1950s and 60s. So this was the way it was promoted, which makes a lot of sense for then. Then you spray, and then you seed. Now here's some demonstrations in 1974 and 1978. Farmers getting all excited about um, no-till. Oh, sorry, direct drill, zero-till. Um, they were full-cut cultivation. But here we've got the Bettinson triple disc drill, which was from the UK, but it didn't have any press wheels on it. I haven't talked to anyone here in Argentina, actually, about when the press wheels came in here. I'd love to do that. If you know someone, tell me. Um, Edward might be able to tell me. But here we've got... Um, so we had some hard-to-kill weeds with spray seed, and one of those hard-to-kill weeds is something you wouldn't call a weed. It's clover, but it's very hard to kill. It's our beautiful um, legume for our pastures, which was gold. But when it comes to seeding, a, a weed is a plant that's out of place. Clover was a weed. So our upfront cost of herbicide was, was new to bankers, so the bank wouldn't loan you money to let you buy a herbicide. Why would you want to do that? Um, so that was a, one issue. Um, poor seed soil contact happened at the beginning. The seed wasn't getting nicely into the soft soil because the soil was t probably damaged with, with tillage or with sheep compaction and no press wheels. The Department of Agriculture was not generally keen, except for a few, including Jeff Pierce, who was a prophet, I think, again, a bit like John Landis in a way. 1970, uh, spray seed price was kept at $5 a hectare by Bill Roy. That was very important, because at that time, uh, the, the rate glyphosate was $35 a, a hectare for one litre. So, so it was much under that, depends on the rate of glyphosate. But the weed problem was ryegrass, ryegrass, ryegrass. Clover, you could kill it with tillage, but ryegrass, you couldn't. And in 1976 to 79, along came a whole range of herbicides, 20 or 10 grass herbicides or whatever. The release of the sulfonylurea chlorsulfuron was exceedingly powerful in projecting, uh, catalyzing our adoption of no tillage. Now, I won't read any of that, but there's a whole range of things that happened that I've, some of them I've touched on already. 
that little blip in the middle was when everybody got excited about spray seed and then the next year they didn't spray their weeds early, the rain came early, the weeds got big, the, the farmers then thought, oh, well, I'm, I've got to do this new technique because it worked really well for farmers last year, the new direct drillers. So they then sprayed with a low rate when the weeds were this big and the weeds didn't die and it was a disaster. So you can see that it went down again. I remember talking to Nono Pereira. He said, in adopting no tillage in Brazil, back we went visited his place on several tours. I've been through America with groups of Australian farmers. And Nono says, we'd have these periods where we'd go well and then we'd have a problem. I'm sure Herbert Bartz would remember the same thing. We have this problem, and Frankie Dijkstra, and then we'd crash. And the scientists would say, ah, oh, no, no, we told you so, it didn't work. But the determined, gritty, thank God Herbert's got a German spine in him. And that determination is what made them push through and ignore, get rid of the noise. We know we're on a good thing and we're going to stick to it. And, uh, and they did, and they needed to be applauded for what they did. But then we learnt to control your weeds earlier. Right, farmers saw benefits that science just struggled with. Um, deferred grazing, earlier time of sowing, therefore better yields, less bogging of the soil, more flexibility with the machinery, with your labour, with time, less stress, we need more of that these days. Less fuel, less maintenance, less depreciation issues. Better soil structure, more infiltration of the water because you've got more soil structure, better soil structure. So the explosion, oh, I said this already, explosion took off in 74 but crashed in 75. But the most incredible thing from a scientific point of view is that the data that was generated was bulletproof to show that this technology works back in the early days, right at the beginning. So why the heck did it take so long to change the mindset? I know I've seen a little, Herbert has got this lovely, uh, or, or Rolf Derpsch has got this lovely um, image on the screen of a head. And he says, I know where the problem with compaction is. It's here. <laughs> and no till. The results were there. Uh, by now, hopefully you've read 240 kilos yield increase over six years, 350, 355. Long-term, scientifically well-conducted trials where they did it well and they've reported the results well. But despite that, no deal did not happen. Here was basically a series of trials to... Th this argument got very strong in Western Australia. Jeff Pearce, the champion, he agitated for trials. Do the trials. Show that no-till long-term is good for the soil. And he was fought and fought and fought against. He and a few others were with him. And ICI, the chemical company, encouraged the Department of Ag to do research. Ten years, then they finally agreed. They had Jeff, John Holmes says there was blood on the floor in the meeting that they had in 1976 and they agreed to a 10-year rotation. They agreed to allow the no-till to be sown three weeks earlier. But as soon as Jeff Pearce went out of the department, they took that away. I hope you're not one of those scientists. But they, and they didn't go to, for 10 years either. They went for six. But for the first two years when the time of sowing advantage was in there, the no-till excelled, except where they didn't have press wheels and where they let weeds get out of control, but that's all very explainable. But it was a convenient truth to say that it didn't always work. Conclusions from the trial. Tillage does benefit sandy loams. We, we've learnt that, and good no-till farmers in Western Australia still do some deep tillage on sandy loam soils. They get a good response for doing so. Um, heavy soils benefit most from no tillage. The soils get softer, they soak it up. They're not like this floor or this stadium. When the water hits, they soak it in. Most soils, no till works just fine. Earlier time of sow advantage was a shown. Right, these are some of the comments that were made by some people. They're negative, so I'm not gonna actually even talk about them. Uh, these are important no-till innovations that happened. The FOPs and the DIM herbicides in 77. Glyphosate became affordable, $6 for 350 mils. That became affordable per hectare. Water use of potential work was done by French and Schultz. Magnificent paper. If you're from another country and you don't know about French and Schultz, I encourage you to go and look at their paper, 1984. It's a landmark paper for Australian agriculture. 
and they encouraged us to go for four tonnes per hectare in an area where we were only growing one or two tonne per hectare. Peter King came and spoke at the Jiramunga um, Conservation Land Management um, Profit Conservation Agriculture pof, Profit or Pipe Dream. And there was an explosion of, uh, there was a, there was something special happened at that meeting. And if you want to know more about it, come and ask me afterwards. Press wheels lifted yields, and I'm pleased to say I was the first one to do that work, reading Bruce Radford's work, this is in West Australia, Bruce Radford's work in Queensland, New South Wales. Um, and lift, we lifted yield by 40% by putting press wheels on, 1987. Um, high yields were shown to be possible, but we then had stubble trouble. We also had tips, points that were wearing out, so we put tungsten tips on. And that was a great innovation. The technique to put the tungsten on the tip of a knife point was very important. Uh, great planes uh, were demonstrated by Tom Adderby. Wool price collapsed, so we had to grow more, more crop to make farming profitable. And then we had a trifluralin breakthrough with knife point use, which is still a story that no one is listening to me around the globe. There's a story in this, folks. If you're worried about weed control and you want to look at an alternative option with difficult herbicides for crop safety, this knife point technology is there waiting for you if you want to use it. Uh, then we had the formation of WANFA, the West Australian No-Till Farm Association, of which I was the editor of their newsletter, and all of their website, art all of their articles that I published, I edited, are on my website, notill.com.au, so you can read the whole story there. It's there for everybody to see. I'm glad to say I'm an honorary life member of WANFA. Stubble became valued as suppressive for weed diseases in the soil which is fantastic. We've just recently discovered, Margaret Roper has, that fusarium is suppressed by microbial activity where stubble is retained. Now, the West Australian farmers have burnt a fair bit of stubble this year, which I'm sad to say, that's not very CA really, but it's been promoted basically to get narrow row spacings and we had big stubbles last year and farmers couldn't harvest at all. We lost 25% uh, of our wheat crop was destroyed to frost, and so we had all this bulk, and then you had to put that through the harvester, and then what do you do with all the straw? Well, some people just said, burn it. And now it hasn't rained for five months, and now we've got bare soil, and we're no-till champions. So there's a bit of an irony going on there. When messages go wrong, big damage can occur. I'm running out of time. Wide rows we did, I talked about that yesterday, low dose rates can cause a problem with herbicide resistance, which Professor Johnny Gressel taught us in 1997 when he came to Australia, which was, and everybody said he was an idiot, he was crazy, but he was spot on. And I took him all around the state for five years telling his message, I took his message with me. And I was ridiculed for five years. And now those that, those that have said, we've discovered that it's true, don't remember where the idea came from. It wasn't me, it was Johnny Gressel. Give him all the credit. But sometimes you have to go through these um, sad times. Adoption graphs, I don't have time to explain this, but it these, this work that's been done by someone I greatly respect, Rick Llewellyn, who is in the audience, um, it, it, it's created some slight misinformation and misunderstanding. Um, and however, and I've, I've done work to, I picked up information from the Australian Bureau of Statistics and my own data and other data to demonstrate. And I had just a tremendous experience through the five years I was working with WANFA. I communicated with 20,000 people on the radio and articles and whatever. But here's the adoption in Western Australia. That's the brown line. This is the area adoption, not the time a farmer first thought about adopting no-till, which he then disadopted. No one, no one continued adoption until 1990. Prior to that, 99.999% of farmers all disadopted. So the previous graph is, um, is not accurate because it's the time when a farmer thinks he first tried no-till. And it shows Western Australia in that open circle right down the bottom there is one of the slowest adopters. So it's, it's misleading. So I've, since this is my PhD work, and my red line is what I believed it was, the official data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics are those black dots for Western Australia. So I'm pleased to say I had my feet on the ground and I knew what was happening and the Australian Bureau of Statistics data confirms it. And also the other states are there. So that's also pretty similar to my guess. I was a little bit out with that blue line, but uh, I wasn't too far off by talking to experts in other states. Right, there's lots of nice little issues I could talk about, but I've run out of time. I showed those yesterday. This is my farm this year, last week. 
and it's terrible. I've had, um, from March, April, May, June, I've had 12 millimetres of rain and I chased moisture with my no-till system by keeping my wide rows and I was able to get some crop established and I think it's going to actually pay for half of my bills this year, not all of them. This is a crop a year or so ago with my two harvesters I've got that I picked up for cheaply. Um, this is the adoption of no tillage. Don't have time to talk you through that, but it will be published in papers very soon. Um, then I'm going to talk about quantifying no-till benefits, and there's a whole heap of... And we're just so lucky in West Australia, we adopted no-till when we did. If we didn't, we would have a lot of farmers that would have gone out of the industry. Um, there's all the benefits and the scientific papers at the right-hand side of those that I can find. There, I'm sure there are others. Um, I've got 60 odd benef 50 benefits and, uh, and I'm going to try and put them into models but I don't know the models can handle it to be honest. Um, right, this is nearly my last photo. This is, this is what we want to see. We want to retain stubble, we want to control weeds, we want to have good crop yields, we want to make it work for everybody. Um, but I do see a dark cloud hanging over agriculture. I just walked out of the university the other day and bang, there was this cloud hanging over the city and I thought, wow, how neat is that? And for today, I think it's perfect. There's a lot of junk science out there. We have to have the courage to argue with each other, stay friends, talk about the facts, the truth, put our agendas aside. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And this is something that is very, very interesting. I suggest you go and look at Ring of Clouds over Jerusalem last year. 23rd of September this year, I think, will be very interesting. The Jewish New Year starts on the 30th of September. And I kid you not, something interesting is happening in the world. Right, and I'd just like to thank APRESID, the Global Congress, whom you're my friends, and all these wonderful people, and there are a few more probably that I forgot to put in. Um, the ones that are bolded have particularly had an impact in my life, and uh, I thank them sincerely, and thank you for your um, kind um, attention today. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, I would like to thank the organizers for this great opportunity uh, given to me to uh, share some of our experiences on conservation agriculture and how it delivers uh, to, to climate smart agriculture and that's what my topic is. How does conservation agriculture delivers to the climate smart agriculture portfolio? Uh, my colleague uh, Christian uh, made a presentation on the same topic yesterday, bringing uh, our experiences from Africa and now I'm bringing some of our experiences from, uh, from South Asia and also Bram made a presentation from Latin America. Uh, that's where Sumit uh, primarily works in the three major regions uh, uh, in different systems. Uh, Uh, I, I, I put my presentation structured uh, under a few uh, bullet lines, so I will give some background. Uh, what are the challenges uh, and, and, and elements of conservation agriculture vis-a-vis -vis, uh, climate smart agriculture? Uh, some evidence on how CA is helping in climate change adaptation and also the food security, which is uh, productivity mitigation, and, and, and of course uh, portfolios of CA or I put in brackets as the climate smart agriculture and how does CA delivers beyond uh, beyond climate smart agriculture. Uh, so I mean at the at the cost of the repetition I'm repeating again the challenges what we are facing in South Asia. Uh, we all know that South Asia is the region with uh, with a lot of population. Uh, we and 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 and, and uh, uh, we, um, the natural resources uh, in South Asia are, I think, two to three times more stressed than other regions of the world. Uh, and and, and it's, it's one of the hottest spots for climate change when we talk about uh, the region. Uh, we know uh, the land holding size, uh, Benson Bard made by several presenters, uh, the challenges of, of energy, 
the challenge, and, and, and you can see the map, the multiple risks uh, when we talk about the climate change. So heat, drought, cold, uh, floods, all those things comes together, and, and, and some of, in some of the places, then both heat and drought comes together, and, and of course, uh, uh, drought, flood comes together. Uh, so so it's, it's really a challenging region. Uh, also, uh, when we talk about natural resource management and, and, and climate-related concerns, uh, uh, I put together under these bullets, so the monsoon variability is, is one of the major challenge before us. Sometimes uh, you get uh, all the rains in, in two days and, and, and there is no rain for two months, and some, something like that, the temperature shoots up. Uh, that's for the planting of, because we, are, we have the monsoonal climate and we are very much dependent on, on monsoon rains for, for planting in majority of the area because South Asia is like 35, 40% uh, irrigated rest is rain fed and rain fed agriculture dependent on the monsoon. Also, the in-season stresses with the heat, drought, or the excess soil moisture many times. The water table, water is a big, big issue, and, 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 and across the world, if you see the, the trend in filing water table, in South Asia is again number one. So we are over-exploiting the water, water, uh, water from the ground, and I don't know how long we can sustain like that. There is an issue of the soil health deterioration, uh, you know, all across the world, but I think we, we, we in the South Asia are uh, uh, more challenged with, with this respect. And of course, the variable response of the crops to the production resources and the inputs. We are not getting good response to the factor productivity is deteriorating. Uh, the pollution, the environmental pollution, the residue burning is, uh, is uh, one of the major, uh, you know, issue, for example, in, in, in uh, South Asia, especially in Northwestern Indo-Gangetic Plain, I mentioned was made by Dr. Sidhu, uh, Dr. Paroda in, in the beginning of the conference and several others. Uh, the intensive tillage is, uh, are again, uh, contributing uh, to the environmental footprints, and of course, the fertilizer use, especially the nitrogen, is contributing to the, this, this challenge. Uh, if you talk about the, the issues of, of, of uh, climate change induced extreme weather events, and if you can see, uh, of the 12 years, eight years were abnormal. Every year, almost every year, we are getting one or the other kind of the stress, whether it's a a delayed monsoon or mon you know, rainfall variability or, or, or cold or heat or you know, cyclones and many things. So that's, that's, that's really challenging. Uh, so almost every year we are getting one or the other kind of the, the, the climatic risk. Uh, so to cope up with these kind of things, what, what we can do actually and how conservation agriculture uh, is climate smart agriculture. Uh, so if you talk about uh, the conservation agriculture or climate smart agriculture, these are not technologies. Basically, these are the consortium of practices and policies together. Uh, practice alone will not help. We have to bring them together. So that's a portfolio or consortium of practices and policies, both conservation agriculture through the three key elements and principles everybody talk about, delivers to the, the productivity, to the profitability, to the efficiency, to the reduction in the emissions, and of course the resilience. And same does the, the, the climate smart agriculture. So, so uh, the three things uh, together, the, uh, what Christian explained yesterday uh, of uh, the three elements of, of, of climate smart agriculture, the adaptation, the food security, and the mitigation. So they are very much aligned. I think conservation agriculture is not only the climate smart agriculture, but does delivers much more uh, than climate smart agriculture. So I try to you know, showcase some of our experiences, how conservation agriculture delivers to the climate smart agriculture. And we start with zero till wheat, which is the one of the, you know, the dominant conservation agriculture based system in South Asia. And you can see a beautiful picture, uh, which I took uh, uh, the 10 years back uh, and, and the same field where uh, Dr. John Landers visited, uh, you know, in 2006 in, in the same field, and I took this picture. I'm happy that I'm sharing this picture and he's sitting here. here. Uh, and, and, and some of the examples, so conservation agriculture and wheat yields under variable climatic conditions. And if you could see uh, the right side uh, table, the March 2004 heat wave you know, affected, affected the wheat production, and we see about Haryana and Punjab, 
the, 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 the food bowl, uh, the major wheat production producing states, and you can see the, the productivity loss uh, up to you know, 9% because of the heat wave. And on the right side, you see the, the, the yield of zero tillage versus conventional tillage over several years, and you can see the two uh, vertical uh, red lines where you see more difference, and those are the, the years where you, we had uh, the heat, you know, terminal heat effects, and where, that's where you see there's a more variation in conservation agriculture and conventional tillage, and that's how the conservation agriculture helps in adapting to, to the, the terminal heat. And this is another example. So you can see the, uh, the canopy temperature, air temperature difference under two sets of the situations, the conservation agriculture and uh, uh, without, without mulching uh, the conventional tillage base. And you can see at the maturity phase, I mean, until 135 days of the, the, the crop growth, there was no difference uh, in, in canopy temperature, air temperature difference. But from 135 to 150 days, which is the grain filling maturity period, and you see 1.5 degree difference in canopy temperature. And that's where conservation agriculture delivers. Now, if you imagine, how many years breeders will take to come up with a variety which beats 1.5 degrees Celsius the temperature? Uh, so here is the technology. Here is the here is the uh, you know and the practice which helps really in adapting to the terminal heat, which is one of the major issue. Now there is another picture: the performance under extreme weather events and the climatic risk. And I cite the example of 2014-15, where government of India had to pay a lot of compensation to the farmers because of the productivity loss. Uh, due to the untimely continuous rains. And, 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 and you see the two pictures, the two cedars looks like alike. They are like same. The go, uh, and, 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 and the price is same, but uh, the, the left side is really happy, the happy cedar. The right side, the rototil. And you can see the, 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 the crop. The right side one is damaged because of the continuous heavy rains, no infiltrations. And, and, and left side, because of the high infiltration rates, crop is, is still happy. And that's where we have the evidence. So you can see this, this graph, uh, this, this, this one, and this one. These are the two. So we have the long-term average rainfall, as well as 2013-14 and 14-15. 14-15 was a really bad year in terms of the, the rains. So there was continuous rains for, for a month. And this, this one and this one. So these things, and temperature was same. So this rain uh, destroyed the productivity, and we come up with a publication uh, on how conservation agriculture is really climate smart. In, in, in uh, uh, you know, to and, and this is for 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 wheat. Now there is another system, and a, a presentation was made by Dr. J. K. Lada yesterday on rice specifically. So I'll I'll just use a couple of slides. Direct seeded rice is another, uh, you know arena of conservation agriculture when we talk about the rice wheat production system, uh, which delivers, uh, you know, to, to, to the climate change adaptation and mitigation, of course. And you can see this picture. This is direct seeded rice, and this is transplanted rice, and this is a, a drought situation in eastern Gangetic Plains uh, of South Asia, in Bihar, particularly in 2015. And you can see the puddle transplanted rice was the direct seeded rice. You can imagine how uh, conservation agriculture helps in adapting to, to the climatic risks. There's another situation where, uh, where we got, we talk about sustainability. So when we talk about sustainability, introduction of the legumes into the cereal, cereal-based systems, and when we talk about conservation agriculture, I think we are advancing the rice cycle into the field rather than the transplanting. And then the window between harvest of the wheat and planting of the rice is less. And uh, there is no way you can fix a legume into the system. And my colleague, Dr. Sidhu, made a presentation yesterday. And that's how also the stubble burning is one. The terminal heat is another one. And this is the way how conservation agriculture delivers to the multiple benefits. So if you go with the, the relay planting of, of, of mung bean, a legume into the system, at the last irrigation, make use of the residual moisture. And, and if you go to terminal heat, Dr. Sidhu showed, uh, and, and you can see here, when you harvest, you have a mung bean crop, which is transpiring water, which is making the canopy cool, so you can get rid of the terminal heat. Also, because of the stubble burning is another problem, when you have a crop like this, there is no way you can burn these stubbles. So this, again, helps in, 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 you know, in, in uh, helping in climate-smart agriculture. This is a, 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 
um, on the productivity side, the because you know food security is one element, and you can see uh, uh, five, six years, seven years of the data. This is conventional tillage-based uh, uh, rice wheat production. This is uh, conservation agriculture-based rice wheat production, and this is a diversified system. We talk about rotation. So maize, wheat, mung bean cropping system, and you can see all across. You know, you have the higher productivity, a lot of, and, and these ups and downs are because of, of the climatic variability. So you can see wherever you have climatic variability, you are getting higher benefits in, in terms of the conservation agriculture. Just an example. There's another cropping system in South Asia, which is cotton wheat system, more than four and a half million hectare, uh, and which is, uh, which is typically uh, a system where wheat productivity is lower, half a ton lower than the rice wheat just because of the delayed plant harvesting of the cotton, delayed planting of the wheat, and that enters in, into the terminal heat. Always there is a risk of, of terminal heat in wheat, and, and that's the reason. So you can see here, uh, again, the 2009-10 was a, 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 a year when we had uh, terminal heat in wheat, and you can see the cotton wheat districts of Punjab had 18% yield loss because of the terminal heat, whereas rice wheat system, 2%. So this is, this is again uh, an important area where, where we need uh, conservation agriculture to help here. And you can see uh, the wheat yields in 2009-10 with relay planting. I, I, I'm not going to make a, mention, a lot of mention about relay planting, but Dr. Sidhu made a presentation yesterday. Uh, 0.87 tons yield advantage versus in 2010-11, which was a normal year, only 0.3 tons per hectare. And that's how the conservation agriculture is really very good in the bad year. It's good in the bad, you know, good year, but really very good in, in, in the bad year and, and, and delivers to climate smart agriculture. This is a picture coming from uh, this year, this monsoon season. Uh, I took almost 20 days back, and this is maize with permanent beds. And this is maize with the tilled beds, fresh beds. Uh, heavy rains over 200 millimeters in three days, and you see the situation of the maize crop, and you can see here, compaction because of the tilled beds, and the roots, no aeration, and the crop is suffering heavily because of the, the heavy rain, whereas this crop, which is permanent bed, is not suffering. So that's how conservation agriculture really helps in adapting to those climatic risks. Uh, it, this also delivers I mean, this is a maize-based system, so we, we have different kind of maize-based system, whether rain paid or irrigated. There is a yield, uh, you know, uh, advantage over the years, and these are the coming uh, uh, analysis we did across the South Asia. I'm not going to the detail. There's another system we have, the sugarcane-based system, where stubble burning is one of the challenges. The delayed planting of, of, of wheat in the, in the wheat, uh, delayed planting of the wheat in, in sugarcane system is another challenge. And uh, that's where you do, so you have a conservation agriculture-based system, sugarcane in the furrows and, and wheat on the top of the bed. If you do that, I think uh, sugarcane come up very fast, and that also helps in adapting to the climatic risk because it's green, it's transpiring water, and keep the canopy cool, and also uh, save on resources, improve soil health and other things. So. Um, uh, now, residue uh, management, residue burning is, is, again, talked about since three days, four days, and which is one of the uh, major challenge we are facing as of now across South Asia, uh, especially the rice uh, residues. And, and there are a lot of news and campaigns, and, and, and people say, uh, let, uh, let not only blame the farmers, because farmers are wise people. We have to provide them technologies to, to solve this problem. They, they, they go 10 tons, 9 to 10 tons of the residues sitting on the surface, and there is no time to, to manage that residues uh, and, and plant their wheat crop on time. And they have a single uh, match stick uh, to manage this. So, so uh, this is challenge. Uh, now I, I relate it with the with the conservation agriculture. Uh, this is the uh, the map where which shows uh, the burning hot spots. This is Punjab. This is Haryana, Northwest, and IGP. Much more burning here than here. Now this is uh, this is uh, again coming from satellite, and then this is the study we did uh, just uh, sent a report a uh, few days back on adoption of, of zero tillage in wheat, uh, and we did last season, I mean this, this season, and you can see it's very much related. So this area, up to 50% of the area of the wheat is no-till, 
less burning, and where is the more burning, less adoption of the zero, zero tillage. So that's how conservation agriculture also helps in, in, uh, in, in, in um, uh, resolving this, this challenge for which uh, we have innovations. And again, Dr. Sidhu showed uh, uh, a video last, uh, yesterday on how Happy Cedar works. What I did, uh, coming from uh, you know, information of the data what we generated, how does that deliver to multiple benefits? And if you talk about this machine particularly, we say more crop per, per drop, and you save at least 40 to 50 centimeters of water per hectare per year. 40 to 50 centimeters of water means the people, I mean, uh, Bill was talking of Western Australia, 40 centimeter water means something. Uh, if we save that much water, uh, uh, also the lower the cost, so 12,000 to 15,000 rupees, which is like uh, 200, 300 dollars per hectare per year. That's contribute to the farmer's profitability. This lowers the greenhouse gas emissions by one ton carbon dioxide equivalent per hectare per year. Uh, reduce the, the chemical load on agriculture. We have less weeds because of the mulching, and we have uh, we can curtail 25% of the fertilizer nitrogen in, in three years of the time when you recycle the residues, which is which is huge. Which also not only the, the reduce the cost of production, but also reduce the environmental footprints and reduce the weather risk. I showed how how the conservation agriculture or this technology helps in in mitigating the climatic risk and of course improve the soil health, which is primarily the organic matter content uh, we have analyzed. The rice, uh, as I said yesterday, there was a presentation on this, uh, how uh, this delivers to the climate change mitigation. Uh, you can see, uh, uh, you know, reduction in the emission of the methane ranging from uh, 20 to, to, to 60 percent if you go with the no-till climate smart uh, agriculture. Uh, this is another one, again, uh, uh, how di and different elements, so inputs and, and, and operations and the emission from the soil, but uh, overall, if you see, this is CA, and this is, this, con uh, this is conventional tillage, and this is CA, the negative. So sequestration, that's how it contributes. Another uh, you know, example, 18 to 62% of the greenhouse gas global warming potential is reduced by conservation agriculture. My colleague Christian did mention about in Africa, there are less studies, but we have a lot of studies on, in South Asia, how that improves into uh, the soil health and also sequester carbon and, and, and reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. Now, this is, uh, again, changes in the carbon stock. So you can see this is conventional tillage base, and these are the, the no-till based systems, so organic or inorganic. All those carbon stocks are much better under conservation agriculture than the conventional. This also helps in reducing the variability in the soil. So this is no-till. For example, this is no-till, and this is EM38 survey, and this is conventional till, and you can see within field variability uh, in, 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 in the soil uh, because, of, because of the conventional tillage-based system. We also reduce, as I said, reduce the nitrogen use. So what you are harvesting with the 150 kg of the nitrogen in conventional tillage, you are harvesting much more than that with 105 kg nitrogen in conservation agriculture. That's how this helps in adapting. Uh, laser labeling was talked about, and this is, uh, again, uh, one, one of the important uh, technology, a fully validated climate smart agriculture practice, which complements to the conservation agriculture. This is not conservation agriculture, but we are talking about conservation agriculture with precision management of the resources, and this, this delivers greatly. Uh, we got a huge impact. This is how we put together different uh, technologies, conservation agriculture-based technologies contribute to different elements of, of food security, of economics, of water, energy, and, and, and of course the reduction in the greenhouse gas emission, but they are in isolation. What we need to do, we need to put them together. So the portfolio of climate smart agriculture practices, and this is I put no-till with precision nutrient management, delivers greatly to reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions, and that's, this is another example. So business as usual to, if you add one layer, just residue incorporation, which is not uh, doing a big deal, and, and it's a long-term process, it takes time to build the carbon. If you incorporate, that needs a cost, and that's why farmers are burning. There is no incentive for them. But if, once you do this uh, with a zero tillage, that delivers the productivity, profitability, and other things. So layering of different technologies, uh, moving from slowly from from residues to reduced till to residues and laser leveling, uh, reduced till and zero till and, and, and residues, and then the, this is like a, 
a full-fledged portfolio which is complementing. And that's how the portfolio uh, comes into the picture, which also helps in reduction in the environmental footprints, water use, and then improving the productivity. Uh, again, um, I, I will not read this, but uh, see these two uh, plots. This is conservation agriculture, this is conservation agriculture, exactly the same. Here we got subsurface drip, and here with the flood irrigation. And you can see the crop scenario with the same application of the nitrogen. So more losses, I think we, if we put them together, the conservation agriculture with precision nutrient water management, that delivers much better to the climate smart agriculture. We have to bring another element, for example, solar energy. So the conservation agriculture with uh, subsurface drip and put a solar energy, that's what's called a clean, you know, uh, 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 green energy. Uh, everything is green and, and, and delivers much more to, 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 to climate smart agriculture. Uh, but one size doesn't fit all. And that's where we talk about the, you know, capturing and, and, and the, the variability of the socioeconomic situations for, for, for scaling. And, and that's what we are trying to do. The farming system, the, the farm, uh, farm household typologies, so bringing socioeconomic and uh, biophysical elements together. Uh, and, and, and through that, we go with the community-based approach. So we are working on climate smart agriculture. We're piloting climate smart villages, uh, bringing the communities together. And when we talk about climate smart village, it's not only the technology. Uh, the portfolio of practices, but also the information services, the local institutions, or of course the community together, uh, and, and how best we can integrate uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the village development plans. Uh, to me, yesterday uh, in, in the afternoon presentation I mentioned was made that conservation agriculture, or we, we people are contributing to, uh, I think uh, it was suggested, uh, told like four sustainable development goals, but I think we are doing much more than that. And uh, I put together these 10 sustainable development goals. We all are contributing to at least 10 sustainable development goals. And of course, conservation agriculture delivers much more to these sustainable development goals. So conservation agriculture is just not climate smart agriculture. It's much more than that. It delivers uh, to, to sustainable development goals. Thank you so much. Thank you for speaking. Muchas gracias. For just two short questions. Just one? Yes. The gentleman in the first line. Yes. Thank you very much uh, for the good presentation and pro uh, very comprehensive presentation, uh, Dr. Jad. I have a question to you about, I have seen in your uh, presentation one slide uh, uh, in the uh, standing uh, wheat, so you are uh, growing this sugar cane. Wheat, yeah. in the wheat field, you are uh, growing uh, sugar cane. How do you organize uh, uh, or how do you conduct uh, harvesting of wheat in this case? Because in the small, uh, in the small plot, it is possible, but if you go beyond for adoption, and it is very difficult to to make uh, this harvest of wheat. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, thank you. It, we are we are growing uh, sugar cane and wheat together, uh, and we, I'm talking about the area which is uh, you know the sugar cane growing area where farmers generally plant wheat, uh, sugar cane after harvest of wheat. Right, uh, which is May. Uh, so harvesting season, planting season, labor availability issues, and all those. What we are trying to do is trying to bring uh, wheat in, you know, together with sugarcane in autumn, in in November, and uh, harvesting. Um, yes, uh, you're right. Uh, as of now, uh, in all of the wheat areas, the harvesting. I mean, sugarcane areas, the harvesting is done manually. So there is no issue of harvesting uh, in, in, in wheat with manually. Uh, we can have these small reaper uh, binders as well. Uh, and, and also depends on the what stage of the sugar cane. So if sugar cane is short, uh, you can go for the reaper binders. And as I say, one size doesn't fit all. So we, we have to have the customized solution for some of those, those issues. Thank you, Dr. Jadar. Well, 
we don't have any time left, so we have to thank the speakers and, well, they will be in the audience so you can further ask them questions there. Thank you.